This is the Watch Geek Time Podcast. Thank you for tuning into Watch Geek Time. This is the Watch Geek Time Podcast. It's a conversation about heritage, history, and why we're so hooked on horology. So sit back, relax. We're going to talk about everything from watches to watches. The Watch Geek Time podcast was recorded live on Saturdays from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific Time. Also stream live at watchgeektime.com. And on Apple TV, I am your host and resident watch geek, Scott Goldman, on the boards as always is. It's Jody, and thanks for having me, Scott. Oh, hello, Jody. Good to have you. So, as uh, we start the show, we just kind of touch base on what Jody and I are wearing today. That's right. Where you go? Well, I mean, I'm really spearing off today. We're sort of getting away from tradition. What is it? Say. It's an Apple, Apple Watch. Oh, boy. And... Uh, it's an interesting thing. I mean, it, to me, it, it can be a good tool, and personally, it's just an extension of the phone. It's a it's a luxury. That's when you say an extension of the phone. What do you mean? Well, I'm just. I mean, I'm just learning this. It's the 42 millimeter uh, Apple Watch with the uh, the nylon woven band, and um, basically, it does everything. I can basically view everything that the 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 phone. Can do i can pull up apps i'll get messages text messages i get calls um play games on it it's it's interesting There's is it replacing the other watches you wear absolutely not no but for in a work situation or travel situation um you might receive a call or a text message or something like that you yeah. don't need to be looking around for your uh, no. your phone so it's got some good safety aspects about it. And if you're in the boardroom, say. Wait a minute. You mean like if you're driving your car, you can... Uh, yeah, you don't just have quickly to look. Your phone that's and, right. You can answer oh, calls. Good. And then you've got your Bluetooth linked up. And it's all luxury items. But And I notice when you twist your wrist, it lights up. <clears throat> that's right. So, that's cool. So sadly, the only real watch thing about it is the fact that when I flip it up, it displays the time, which is, you know... Well, it's always it, it, good, as we say on Watch Geek Time, it's good if a watch tells the time. That's true. But, so, yeah, it's it's okay. But All right, let me see that. Just hold it up there. Oh, yeah. Hmm. I think Apple has a problem with this watch, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. We'll stick to the pieces of the show, and then we'll talk about smart watches and probably straps later. Right. That? All right, good. Uh I'm wearing my Georges Lecourt and a nice looking one master too. control yeah. today. This is my dress watch because it's just hours, minutes, and seconds. This one's in stainless steel. I love it. It's my first JLC. Sadly, my uh, Amvox has gone back to the spa again. Oh, so what are you gonna do? I'm happy with the one I got on though. It's, was, it's a nice watch. Thank you. That is a nice watch. All right, so we got a lot to get to today, uh, least of which is today's watch geek term, which is isochronism, which we will talk about in a minute. Before we get to this week's brand focus, which will be Cartier and Ulysses Nardin, we're going to answer a few email questions, so take it away, okay, Jody. We got here. So we've got a, a Mr. Richard Federer from Fort Lee, New Jersey, writes. Okay, so we've got... Uh, a, a, a question from uh, Mr. Richard Federer from Fort Lee, New Jersey, writes, Dear Scott, can you please explain what a minute repeater is? How is it different than a quarter repeater? And what is a decimal repeater? All right. Well, so that guy's got three questions, and we'll, we'll break it down one piece at a time. A repeater watch is a watch that chimes, traditionally, the time... Hours first, followed by double strikes for the quarter hour, followed by single strikes to signify the minutes. They were originally designed 
to be heard in the dark because like 150, 160 years ago, you just didn't flick a light switch on. But more to the point, they were given to guys who were, say, the foreman in the mine, down in the mine shaft, and, and they didn't even chime. They just, there were hammers that struck the bottom of the case. Right. So, for instance, here, uh, let's, let's chime one up, for example. So that sounded like 8.55. Right. Because I heard yeah. eight chimes, followed by three b Followed by 10 single chimes. Yeah. That would be 8.55. So that's how the minute repeater works. Chimes the hours first, quarter hours, and then minutes. Right. So you can imagine at 11.59, your watch is making a lot of noise. <laughs> that's right. Now, uh, essentially, a quarter repeater is just that which chimes on the quarter hours. And a decimal repeater is even cooler because it double chimes on the 10 minutes. So, for example, 445 would sound like this. Bing, 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 bing for four. Bida, 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 bida for 40. Right. And then bing, 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 bing for the the four minutes. Right. So... The decimal repeater will never chime more than nine times to signify the minutes. Okay. Whereas a quarter repeater could chime 14 times. Right. When the minute's 59 on the hour. Anyways, I hope that answers your question, Mr. Richard Federer of Fort Lee, New Jersey. What are you trying to do? Making me sick? (laughs) Okay, next question. All right. So we go, go on here from Kerry from Lompoc, California. And she writes, Dear Scott, I see that F. Pajon is making ladies' watches, but they have a quartz movement. Isn't this considered blasphemy in the world of hot horology? <laughs> blasphemy. <laughs> blasphemy, Carrie from Lompoc. Uh, no, not if it's F. Pajon. Remember, this is the guy who is making quarter repeaters, a quarter uh, minute repeaters inside of sterling's uh, instead of stainless steel cases and remember traditionally as we spoke of last week repeaters are almost always made in white gold or rose gold or even platinum which is probably the worst metal for a repeater right because it sounds like a thud right but fp jorn knows that stainless steel is the best material for a repeater it has the best resonance best sound Right. And as far as ladies' watches go, uh, ladies, no offense, but a piece of jewelry is more like a watch to you. So a watch is not something you're going to wear every day. You're going to accessorize your watch. That's why he makes them in many different colors. But the quartz idea is that if you're not wearing the watch, you want it to be running when you do wear it. Now, men's watches require a winding or they self-wind. Many many of us have our watches on winders, so our watches are always running, right? Yeah. Now, what's really cool about the Jorn Quartz watch is when a uh, Jorn Quartz watch or lady's watch is laid down into the drawer, it actually, the hands stop moving. Really? It keeps telling the time inside, but to conserve energy... It disengages the mechanics of it. He has a very sophisticated drivetrain built into his quartz watch that wow. disengages those hands to save power. So when you pick the watch up and you put it on, the hour hand will start moving to what the current hour is, and the minute hand follows. It's quite astounding. I'd like to see that. Yeah. yeah that, that. It, you know, we'll go to the boutique because I think we're due to make a trip over there and yeah. say hello to those people. They showed me some stuff last week or so ago that was really simply fantastic. So right. I like them at yeah. Francois Paul Jorn. <laughs> Anyways, uh, speaking of ladies' watches and quartz watches, you know, Carrie, 
I suggest if you're going to get a watch and you're looking at F.P. Jorn and you do like men's watches, they have many other watches that are mechanical. And if you're a, a bit more of a purist, then, of course, mechanics are for you. Right. Right. All right. So I think that does it for this week's email. If you have questions or comments about the show, please write to us. Scott at Watch Geek Time. Jody. I'm just pushing up this fight. I, hate I see that. Wait, I hear that. I see that and I hear that. We're going to step aside for a minute, let the man get his due, because somebody's going to have to pay for that Apple Watch that I see over there. Mm-hmm. Only about 350 This is the Watch Geek Time podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll be right back after these words. When you wrestle a gorilla, you don't stop when you're tired. You stop when the gorilla's tired. That's why, if you have a prang and your wheels just aren't turning, the good folks at More Than could send you a courtesy car within two hours. To find out more, visit morethan.com. I'm More Than Freeman. Thank you for listening. Exclude Northern Ireland. Offer may be withdrawn at any time. Terms and conditions apply. Comprehensive cover only using our recommended repairers. There is a watchmaking standard that is revered around the world. That standard comes from Rolex. From clasp to bracelet to its unique watertight oyster case, a Rolex holds its value because it was intended to. Crafted from just three precious metals, platinum, steel, and gold, each defies the ordinary. Its steel, 904L, virtually indestructible and corrosion resistant, is incomparable. Its patented Everose Gold, created in an exclusive foundry, will remain beautiful for life. Inside, a genuine Rolex movement is a product of superiority and remarkable testing. It is unrivaled. At Rolex, flawless standards create more than a watch. They create a value that was meant to endure. For a complete selection of Rolex timepieces, visit your official Rolex jeweler. Available at Lux Bond and Green Jewelers, Westport, Greenwich, and other locations throughout Connecticut and Massachusetts, where every box has a story. This is the Watch Geek Time Podcast. Just like the man said, this is the Watch Geek Time Podcast. I am your host and resident watch geek, Scott Goldman, as always at my side is... Is the Jody. The Jody. With the Apple Watch. I'm growing on this. It's growing on me, actually. I like how you can... You change the dial several times you change the look of the watch several times during the break right and it it, one of the uh the images for the um it actually has a clock face it does oh so you can just keep changing yeah and i can flick through and it's just got all these different have you downloaded any apps any apps on there jody no it, it, it reflects the apps on the um the phone but i haven't actually downloaded any apps that are actually designed for the the watch itself all right, well, yet. We'll leave it for so. next week. All right, we'll get to it. The Watch Geek Time podcast is recording live on Saturdays from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific time. Also stream live at watchgeektime.com on an Apple TV. <laughs> okay, so as you know, every week we talk about two watch brands. We're going to talk about isochronism in a little bit, but for now. Isochronism. Isochronism. Not isochronism. Cronyism. Which was um, something that what, ran rampant in the Bush campaign. All right. Uh, da, da, da. So, the two brands we're going to talk about today, Cartier and Ulysses Nardin. We'll come back to isochronism in a sec. Okay? Yeah. Cartier was founded in Paris in 1847 by a guy named Louis-Francois Cartier. And he founded it when he took over the workshop of the guy that taught him how to make watches. I don't have his name for some reason. Okay. Do you know his name? I, I don't. I'd have to uh, research that. <laughs> That's where it says. It yeah. says in, in brackets, this is research. Uh, 27 years later, Louis-Francois's sons, Alfred, and Louis-Francois II, 
and Pierre and Jacques took over the factory and became responsible for establishing the Cartier brand all over the world. Now, what's really cool is the Cartier brand, like other iconic brands, they have watches they're absolutely famous for, the Santos. Santos was actually born out of this idea from a Brazilian pilot named Alberto Santos Dumont. He was a good buddy of Cartier's, and he was complaining at a dinner party, I guess, about the impracticability or impracticality of pocket watches uh, on an airplane. So Louis designed a flat wrist watch with a distinctive square bezel, and that became known as the Santos. And this was really their first watch. And I guess a square bezel back in that day would have been an unusual rarity, I would imagine. It would was a, it was an all-new design because, remember, most pocket watches, if not all watches, were round. round. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the, the photograph here, and you can see it on the website at watchgeektime.com, you can see that he actually used a, a mixture of gold and stainless steel or at that in that that first watch actually was a mixture of gold and sterling silver right um and it's obviously very very distinct and it's reminiscent of santos dumont and this certainly became one of their most popular watches and then later they came out with what was known as the tank watch uh they have the mystery dials, which they're very famous for. Mystery dial watches, you don't even see the hands connected to anything. They're painted on these acrylic uh, discs. It's really slick, oh, okay. really, really slick. So, All right. So uh, in 1907, ironically, Cartier signed a deal with our friend Edmund Yeager, who was working with, of course, Le Coultre, to be the supplier of movements to Cartier. And while Cartier later joined forces in the 1920s with Yeager Le Coultre to produce movements solely, they still bought movements from other companies like Vacher and Constantine, Admir BK, Movado and Le Coultre. But it was also at this time where Cartier started making their own calibers and their own watches. And it's really interesting how Jacquet Cartier took charge of the entire operation and has now officially moved it to Bond Street in London. And that's where it's been ever since the 1920s. And they're producing their own movements? They absolutely produce their own yeah. movements. And now they're a company that's owned by... Of course, our favorite, the Richmond Group. Hmm. And as we say all the time, Richmond owns a, a real plethora of fine watch brands. Cartier is not just a watch brand, but they're a fine jewelry brand. Right. Which sort of explains why Swatch was interested in Harry Winston. Okay. Because Harry Winston's really a jewelry company. Right. And Swatch owning Breguet was not owning a jewelry company or owning Omega or owning Jacques Edreau, but then they bought Harry Winston. Right. So it's very similar to how Rupert, uh, Johann Rupert from Richmond, the chairman, a very, very smart and right. crafty South African guy runs the show. He owns Cartier, he owns IWC, Jaeger Le Coultre, uh, Panerai, A. Long and Son, I mean, a whole, a whole oh, bunch of Mont yeah. Blanc. We could keep going. Even Grubel and Forzi. So, uh, moving on to the next brand. I mean, we could talk about Cartier all day. I'm not going to. One thing I think is interesting, um, if you ever look really, really closely to Cartier, you'll notice that the thin line of the V at number seven, so the V, the VII at seven o'clock. The thin line, if you look closely, says Cartier. I didn't know that. That's an anti-forge move. 
All right, so our next brand that we're going to talk about is uh, Ulysses Nardin. And of course, I, uh, I'm biased to the brand since I picked up my first one just a couple weeks ago, and mm-hmm. I've, I've, I've worn it with great thoughtfulness and love. It's a beautiful watch. And I it get, is a nice piece. It's, it's, yeah. it's come to be known as the Bumblebee. It's a Bumblebee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Ulysses Nardin. Uh, Ulysses Nardin founded the company in 1846. Now, you know, they were not a watch company as we know it. They were actually a ship's chronometer company. That's where they started. So, uh, historically, they built these clocks for ships. And and we've already talked about chronometers for ships. Right. uh, I invite everybody to read the book Longitude and understand the history of John Harrison and all that stuff. And we will talk about him on later shows. And he always does come up in conversation. Uh, Safe for it to say, under his father's tutelage, Leonard Frederick Nardin, Ulysses really, really became a master under Frederick William Dubois and Jean-Louis Richard, these two master watchmakers whose fame had extended beyond the mountains of Neuchâtel, Switzerland. I hear the angels. Nice. Yes. It's very inland and far away from the ocean. I it's mean, a long way. Yeah. Now, we also know that Ulysses Nardin's marine chronometers have seen service with over 50 navies from over 50 different countries. So obviously, they're very well thought of and trusted. As a lot of the modern Swiss companies go who are making watches, they bought the names of old historical nautical companies with great heritage, and Ulysses Nardin is no exception. In 1983, the company was acquired by Rolf Schneider, who, in conjunction with master watchmaker Ludwig Oschlin, relaunched the brand. And these two guys, Schneider and Oschlin, would come to produce some really complicated pieces using some of the most modern materials and manufacturing techniques uh, in specific silicium escapements and all this kind of stuff that they pioneered. Oschlin is considered an absolute genius. And then in 2014, Ulysses Nardin was acquired by the Curing Group. So it's no longer really truly an independent and the Curing Group was formerly known as PPR. So what we know of today is that Ulysses Nardin is, uh, I guess, one of the more under-the-radar brand, but one of those brands where people who are in the know are drawn to it. I've noticed with my own watch collecting that I see a natural progression in my my appreciation of watches. First of all, I'm going through this cycle now where I only want to own watches that I actually wear. Right. So, you know, I've got a number of vintage pieces that are sitting locked away. Yeah. And I just look at them and I go, eh, I don't wear you. You're a trailer queen. <laughs> you know, it's like guys who have a lot of fancy cars, but they never drive them. Exactly. What's they, the, uh, what's the yeah, deal? Yeah. And they say, I-, I don't want to put miles on it. Well, What's the point of that? Exactly. It's it, it's there to enjoy, you know, but just having it sit there is not doing any benefit to anyone because no one's looking at it or appreciating that piece. Exactly. So, so that's the way I feel about right. it. Right. So in terms of that, you know, um, there are some Ulysses Nardin pieces I'm growing to really like. There's this freak. Okay. And again, I invite you to look at it on the website, watchgeektime.com. The freak is really, really cool. Uh, And there's a couple other pieces that are really cool. But like everything, I've sort of progressed in this way. Um, We know I love this this brand, Jaja Le Coultre. Of course, Rolex makes a beautiful watch. Uh, Panerai, I, 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 I loved and maybe don't love so much now, but appreciate it very much. Right. Uh, but when it comes to stuff that I own, I want to make sure I'm wearing it. You know, the independent watches that I have from Habring 
or from Kari. I wear them. Oh, they're, and they're beautiful. And it, that's the one thing I like is that you circulate your watches. Like whenever I see you, you're, you're wearing a different watch, and it's great. Well, and it's, it's fun. And, and you know what? What what I think is great is like. The other day I showed up in the studio to, to put a track down for a guy and the engineer said, oh, what watch are you wearing today, Goldie? <laughs> and I, I said, oh, I'm wearing my brand new Ulysses Nardin. And he looks over, he goes, dude, that's a bumblebee. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> that's cool. So, yeah, it's fun. Um, I don't think that my collection is, is as vast as some others, but... I'm I'm getting there. I've I put sort of an embargo on myself right, right. now. Yeah, just gone absolutely <laughs> nuts. But again, my rule right now is, uh, if I own it, I'm going to wear it. Right. Yeah, there's some exceptions. I mean, obviously the the old pieces that are tucked away that are family heirlooms. They're right. They're vampires. Yeah. They don't yeah. need to see the light of day. You know. I do take them out and give them a wind and smell them and touch them but i don't i'm afraid of them beat them up every you know yeah drop them by accident on purpose you know right anyways uh with that said i i don't know about you but that music tells me you go we gotta pay the man all right man this is the Watch Geek Time Podcast. I am going to flip it off. Well, no, I'm not flipping it off. I'm giving it off to the man. Hand it off. We'll be right back. There are movements so perfect, you'd hardly think they were made by humans. Coaxial, the most perfect mechanical watch movement in the world. And now, here's the watch geek, Scott Goldman. Thank you for joining us on the Watch Geek Time Podcast. I am Scott Goldman, your in-house resident watch geek, as always. I'm with my good buddy, Jody. Jody, when we left off, we were talking about it was ca- the Cartier, the and we talked about Ulysses Nardin. Right. Now we're going to talk about the watch geek term of the day. Isochronism. Isochronism. You know, it's interesting. You brought this up inadvertently a couple weeks back when we talked about uh, constant force and the right. issue with a mainspring whose power is different when it's fully wound as opposed to when that same spring starts to unwind. That's right. And how to keep a consistent... Y- yeah, have that energy transferred consistently is... It's very, very important and, and it's been achieved through different things through constant force is one method... I think you and I have looked at fusi chain right. situations and different things. Isochronism is actually part of this concept. And, you know, isochronism is, is a pretty important idea in watchmaking because it, it presupposes that the watch is going to function when it's in all different sorts of positions and under all kinds of different stresses and no matter what the watch is going to keep good time no matter how I, and exactly. that's so like when you see one of these testing devices the machine it, it, it puts the the watch like this and then it spins it around and turns it upside down and then it turns it sideways and it spins it the other way right. so it gets an average rate of the watch in all different positions right. now um 
as we all know, modern mechanical watches, they utilize a mainspring that is actually now shaped in a way where it evens out the power curve. Really? Well, yeah. So, I mean, if you, if you were to uncoil a, a brand new one, you'd see that the beginning of it or the, 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 the end of it, depending on how you think of it, has, this, has the tightest coils. They're the they're narrowest of coiling. And it gets, as, as you get towards the middle, the coil gets a little wider or the, the actual hairspring gets a little wider. Right. And then at the bottom of the, of, the, of the spring, the curve is actually going backwards a little bit. So the shape enables the spring to keep a constant power force over at least 24 hours. That's why most watchmakers who say their watch has a six or seven day power reserve, they still recommend you wind it every day. Right. So that's the ideal, uh, ideal way to keep isochronism in play. So next week, I'm sure we'll have some questions on isochronism. Yeah. I'm not sure yeah. I'm prepared yeah. to answer them. We might have to get a watchmaker on the phone next week. That'd be great. All right, That'd we'll be- see what we can do. A uh, couple of watch resources to check out that I've found to be really, really great. Uh, I love a blog to watch.com. I think uh, purest pro com is a great site also known as watchprosite.com. Hodinky has some great material and content and my favorite watch app is Watchville. 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 Just go to your Play Store or your iTunes Store and type Watchville and you'll get the Watchville app. It's got a really handy dandy uh, atomic clock built into it. So okay. it's nice. All right. All right, so that'll do for isochronism. So let's, uh, let's break it down into your smartwatch for today. I want to talk a little bit about smartwatches and where I think the market is headed and why I think that they're good and bad and indifferent. My first thought is with Apple, Apple has for the first time created a culture war within their product, their family of products. I'll give you an example. If you have an iPad and I have an iPad, that's the same iPad that Warren Buffett has. Right. The cool factor is the fact that you and I can own the same thing as an ultra rich guy. Right. Uh, you and Ellison, Larry, you and Larry Ellison and I all drink the same Coke. Right. There's nothing different about our Coke. Yeah. Might be a different in the Coke he's snorting, but I don't <laughs> snort. All right. So when it comes to this iWatch or this Apple Watch, because they don't want to call it an iWatch. It seems to me you can get it with a gold bracelet. You can get it with a gold trim. You can spend fifteen grand on it, or you, as you were telling me during the break, what did you? What did it, this was? Uh, this set me back around three fifty. Okay, so it's the base model. It looks big. It's bigger, so it's good for guys like us. We're guys with bigger wrists. And um, you can order it all different uh, bands. Um, Obviously, it comes. This is the uh, the gray, but they come in like a silver and a gold and a rose gold. Okay, so they come in they so. come and they come in different materials, and right. you can order a very expensive one if you want. Right. And so really, what it represents for the first time in the Apple family of products is a class system where right. you and I don't have the same Apple Watch. Right. Mine has rose gold. Yours has that. It's the that the, carbon fiber, whatever right. that is. So, it's the first time we're actually we don't have the same thing. Right. I think that's a problem, and I don't think that's something Jobs would have gone for. Yeah, good point. Now, with that said, I think if anything, people who are wearing the Apple Watch or people who never wore a watch. One of my buddies who loves his Apple Watch wears his. Every day. He wears his pure, we call it his purest watch. He'll wear a, a mechanical watch on his left wrist and he wears his, oh, okay. his Apple Watch on his right wrist. And mostly because he says when he's driving, he can, he can safely, quickly dismiss yeah. or whatever. He doesn't have to touch his phone. But you know, the, the, there is the thought too. I mean, you, you get a beautiful device like this, you pay a lot of money for it. And then in a year's time, it's out of date. 
Well, that's the that's the it's, magic that Apple has created. This forced obsolescence, which you know makes me insane. Right. Uh, side note: uh, Jody and I are also musicians, and we're recording artists, and we rely heavily on Apple's products to produce our music. And uh, this forced obsolescence has made me insane. Right. So I'm going to boycott the Apple Watch. I don't have an iP- I don't have an Apple phone. I do have an iPad, which you know I use with the studio, but right. otherwise, <sighs> I'm not, I don't think Apple's going to be advertising with us anytime soon. Right. Now, a neighbor has an Android phone, and he swears by his, uh, he has a Samsung phone. Uh, has he got the watch? He has the yeah. Samsung watch, and he has the latest generation. And I, I like it a lot. Now, one, one thing that I think is interesting is that some of the other uh, Swiss watchmakers now are jumping into it. Tag Heuer okay. is making a connected watch. You know, Beaver right. uh, has made it an initiative that absolutely we're going to make smart watches. Swatch is jumping in. Ah, so they're all leaning in. So the they're all lining so. in. I, mm-hmm. I, I think probably the most interesting thing that I saw was a smart strap where it was the strap that had the technology. And if you, were a, if you were a diver, you had a strap that interacted with your phone that you could transfer data with. If you were a pilot, you had a strap. And the strap had a, had a, a way to display stuff to the, to the uh, dial. Yeah. But, uh, you know, again, I, as a purist, I don't want to poo-poo anything. Uh, I think it's a very interesting device for those that it brings into the watch world. I'll tell you, the greatest thing I saw with your watch was I saw a guy hand his phone to somebody, handed his iPhone to somebody, and said, hey, will you take a picture of us? Just hold the phone over here. And he could see what the phone was seeing on his 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 Apple Watch. And he was telling the guy, hey, okay, a little to the left, oh, a little higher, a little to the right, a little right. Okay, perfect, hold still. And then he activated the camera from, from, the, phone. from the watch. From the watch. That, yeah. that was, cool. That, that was cool. that was good. The other app that I like, which I think is interesting, is the, the proximity thing that you and I were talking about, how right. I can open the, the, the car. Right. Now, that's good and bad. But to your point, you said, well, if I'm anywhere near my... My uh, iPad, it, it recognizes that I've got my Apple Watch on, and, and if I'm will, anywhere in where my Mac, it just lets me in. It, it doesn't, logs you in automatically, yeah. yeah. There's a proximity piece to it, and I think that's very interesting anyway. So, so with that said, I think uh, we'll move on to uh, our last topic of the day, and that would be straps. Right. Uh, we didn't really talk about it at the top of the show, but just... Uh, just keep mindful that I think we would all agree that it really doesn't matter what timepiece you have, the strap that you put on it is everything. So uh, we did a little article at a blog to watch.com recently where we talked about what colors you might want to pop on the dial. And uh, the example given was a Jaeger LeCoultre chronograph. It had some orange accents, so we got a nice strap with some orange that was Stitching. nice. That looked really good. And it really popped the yeah. orange nicely. And I think the discussion was the difficulty of finding a strap that doesn't taper, which, believe me, is a big pain in the ass. Right. So that watch, so for instance, the, the watch that you're wearing right there, notice how the strap tapers where the buckle is. It exactly, actually yeah. it, it gets narrower. And if you saw the way original straps were made and the way the buckles fit to the strap, you have these straps that don't taper. And what's interesting about the strap that you're wearing is it's very, very wide up until the very almost last... Near the... Uh, yeah, see how, how right, wide it is yeah. towards the, yeah. the, the uh, lugs of the watch? And then, boom, it gets very narrow down towards right. the buckle. So I think that's a comfort move that Apple went for. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So if you look at this watch here, the the... Contro- the master control I'm wearing, it definitely tapers. See how it gets, it's very subtle. It's, it's not, very so it's, it's, it's but it, but it's it's 22 at the lugs, and then 
18 all the way down here. Right. So it does taper quite a bit. And that's, again, that's always been done for comfort. And since some of the vintage watches that I own required that they not taper, boy, that was a real trouble to find okay. those. Yeah. But uh, check out the article that uh, was posted. It's called Strap Me Up. Talks about the sizes of straps and what the numbers mean. Usually it's the length of one side of the strap, which is then got a slash and the length of the other side of the strap followed by the taper or the size of the strap at the lugs followed by the taper. Do they have a good itinerary? Have they got a good selection there? Or? Uh, great. Right. And a blog to watch? Yeah. Or Well, a blog well, to watch, you'll, you'll find the article, and then in the article I sent, uh, there's a number of links in the article where to find where good you straps. Can, yeah. Yeah, probably that. Yeah. Um, but I think I should start my own website called strapmeup.com. <laughs> Don't take my idea. Okay, well, I, why do I see you putting your hand down on that board, Jody? Is it that time already? It's that time. Oh, I'm glad one of us is keeping track of it. This is the Watch Geek Time podcast. We're going to step aside for, I don't know, 90 seconds. It's the only way Jody and I can afford these fancy doodle watches that we like to buy. We'll be right back with Watch Geek Time. Thanks for listening. A hungry bird said to a crocodile, Can I have those bits of meat stuck between your teeth? Dive in, said the crocodile. I've had a good nosh. Next day, the grateful bird brought all his mates. And from then on, the birds were never hungry. And the crocodiles never had to fork out for a hygienist. And the moral is, goodwill spread around gets around. This story was brought to you by ING Direct. 92% of whose mortgage customers would recommend them to a friend. ING Direct, a decent way to do banking. Visit ingdirect.co.uk. UK residents 18 plus, 50,000 to a million pounds subject to status. 92% based on ING Direct customer satisfaction survey, April 2011. Sometimes you get more done without a boss. Not that leadership isn't valuable. It's just that when you don't have anyone looking over your shoulder, you often come up with better stuff. At Honda, we run our research and development team as a separate company, giving them room to mess around, doodle, try, fail, try again, and eventually come up with something that surprises them as much as it surprises us. Do you believe in the power of dreams? Rolex, Patek Philippe, Jaeger Le Coultre, Omega, Cartier, Breguet, and just about any other watch brands that come to mind. This is the Watch Geek Time Podcast. Well, Jody. Is it that time? It's the good times. It's the good times. The end of another great Watch Geek time. I thank you for making the trip all the way from Las Virginis today, Jody. You're welcome. Agura, actually, today. Yeah. Agura. It was. A uh, little programming note. Just want to make sure everybody knows next week. We will be getting Gary Vedetta from Element in Time on the phone. He's going to tell us about his new stuff. That'll be great. He's going to tell us like about that. his personal collection. I think he just added a Patek 5170. We're going to try to get Leo Gwynn on the phone. He's the manager at the Leo, Leo, at the Jaeger Le Coultre Boutique in Beverly Hills. Another good one. And uh, I think our good buddy Brady Smoot's going to come over finally and show us those wondrous campanolas from his collection. Great. Again, I thank you, Jody. You're welcome. And I'd like to thank all of you listeners. Appreciate you subscribing to the Watch Geek Time. Visit us at watchgeektime.com on Apple TV. This is the Watch Geek Time podcast. 
it's a conversation about heritage, history, and why we're all so hooked on neurology. I'm Scott Goldman. Until next week, bye-bye.